and harder than a Liberal Party frontbencher. Um, he's, uh, he's got everyone here, including Richard Wells and Ross Wellington, I've just noticed. So uh, they're, all, uh, they're all coming out for this one. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name's Chris Williams. I'm the uh, president of the Australian Herpetological Society. And thank you all very much for coming along to uh, celebrate 70 years. It's, uh, it's a wonderful milestone, and I'm really thrilled to see so many people coming to, uh, to support the event. Uh, Look, events like this don't happen um, without a tremendous amount of planning. We've got a great committee that are committed to pulling these sort of events together. So um, a big thank you to Bob King, Anthony Tonks, uh, Stimo, Chelsea Mayo, Kane Durant, Rachel Durant. You've both got your own surname, see that? Um, uh, Mitchell Hodgson, Kelly Novak and, uh, and Frank, who's manning the shop up there for us. Um, the Victorian Herpetological Society, the Mexicans, have made the, the trip up to support us, and we're really uh, thrilled that they've been able to do so. Uh, thank you to Illawarra for um, also uh, making a trip en masse and also supplying one of the uh, raffle items that you can see down the front, the, the shirt there. Uh, and of course, the Central Coast Herb Society uh, also uh, lending their support. Um, increasingly, uh, the keeping of reptiles and birds and many other animals is going to be coming under threat uh, from very well-meaning yet uh, misguided um, individuals and groups. And for our hobby to uh, not just survive, but to be able to flourish, uh, it's only going to happen if there's a unified approach from these organisations. And I think it's wonderful that we do take these opportunities to get together and everyone to uh, you know, band together and support each other. And it's through these sorts of networking opportunities that we're able to uh, uh, build a stronger community. Um, we've got a terrific lineup for you. Jerry Swan, Steve Wilson, Hal Cogger, John Cairn, Joe Ball and Philippe de Vaugelay, who flew in yesterday from America, will all be giving talks. Um, look, today is a, is a party, okay? It's a celebration. Um, and like any good party, it's not about making money, um, which is very fortunate because um, this is, when we set out to do this, we knew it was going to cost us, and we're not looking to make anything from it, which is lucky, but um, we'll claw back as much as we can as well. So there's plenty of items in the silent auction. We've got a shop up there with items for sale, and uh, we've got some fabulous items in the, uh, in the raffle as well. Probably the, uh, the most interesting piece is this poster you can see over to here. Um, this was uh, donated by Johnny Larson. So that's a, an exact reproduction of a poster that was produced in Victoria in 1890. Johnny, 1890? Yep. Um, and that was hanging in schools and train stations uh, just to alert everyone to uh, the dangers of uh, travelling to Victoria. Um, there's only two known originals, and, uh, and Johnny, after he was able to secure one of them, uh, had a few made up, and this is one of those, and uh, that'll obviously be the, uh, the major focus of the raffle tonight. So please support it and, uh, and buy a ticket. Um, what else, what else, what else? Illawarra have supplied the, uh, the shirt down the front here. We've got that covered. Um, initially, we were going to be having um, this event start at one o'clock with the same speaker lineup with some gaps in the middle for breaks and all that sort of stuff. Um, when we shortened uh, the time to kick off right now at three, um, it just meant that we're going to have to keep things rolling. So there's going to be Jerry and Steve speak. We're going to break for half an hour with um, uh, a bit of a celebration for the 70th, and then we'll kick on with the Can and Cogger Q&A. Um, we've got Can here. We don't have a Cogger yet, so uh, hopefully Hal turns up pretty soon. Um, and uh, you can see on your desk, we've also got uh, a flyer there. The AHS has gone into the book business as well. Um, we're producing a, uh, a book with Read New Holland, um, really to, to highlight the photographers that are involved with herpetology. Um, it's been supported by some fantastic uh, photographers from around the country. We've got um, uh, Ken Griffiths, who's contributed to the book, Hal Cogger, Steve Wilson, Peter Saltes, Gunter Schmoder, uh, John Cairn, Ross McGibbon, Max Jackson, Etienne Littlefair and a whole host of others. So each of the 25 photographers have each provided five photos and they've given a, the background story to the photo and how it came about. Um, 
what we've also wanted to do is provide all the societies that are here and supporting us. As the authors, we get a 40% discount on the book, um, and we'd like to offer that discount to everyone else so you guys can take a box back and sell it to uh, uh, your members if you wish to. Um, there's memberships on the back of all those flyers, so um, yeah, it'd be great to uh, see you supporting it. Okay, that's it. I'll be back soon, but uh, now I'd like to hand you over to uh, Jerry Swan for the history of the AHS. Okay, well, um, when Chris first approached me about this, um, I got the obviously mistaken impression that I had about 45 minutes. I now um, realise I've got about 35. So um, <clears throat> if there's the odd silence, I'm not dying. Um, I haven't had a heart attack. I'm just deciding which bits I'm going to cut out. Um, now, if there's, first of all, Oh, see how we go. Curses, I thought I got out of that. <laughs> okay, the AHS or the Australian Reptile Club, Australian Herpetological Society is now 70 years old. And David McPhee, of course, is to blame completely for the fact that I got lumbered with, with fiddling around with the history. David and I used to catch up uh, quite often and he was con very concerned that the early history of the group would be lost forever as the originals were fast falling off the perch. In fact, David himself died last year. Um, so somewhere along the line, I must have foolishly said that I might have a look at it. Uh, and I did. In actual fact, what I decided to do was to carve it up. I'm only looking at the first 50 years of the society. That was enough. Um, I decided to carve into bite side chunks, 10 years, so a decade. I've gone through about three of those now, um, so into the fourth. However, the history I've decided, okay, we, we just have to look at it, we'll take a broad brush approach. I'm not gonna try and cover 70 years, I'm not even gonna try to cover 50 years. I think the interesting thing for most people will be the very early history of the, the group. The first year, the people that were there, the events that happened at that time, um, so it will deal mainly with that, but in no particular order. Okay. Now there's a book, Venom, by um, Brendan Murray, which some of you may have read, and that in actual fact has um, a lot of references to early Australian Reptile Club Herp Society members, uh, because he was dealing with taipans, and of course um, we had Kevin Budden, um, who was a member of the society, one of the initials, and, and died from taipan. Okay, um, now we'd better see if I can get something up here. Okay. <laughs> Nothing of mine. <laughs> so. However, all right. Um, 1949, when they kicked off, just four years after the end of the Second World War, and despite a prevailing sort of negative attitude towards reptiles, there were actually a surprising number of individuals who were actively involved. Two that come to mind are George Longley and um, Tony Ormsby, both here in Sydney, who wrote a lot of um, articles that went into the proceedings of the Royal Zoological Society of New South Wales. So they were there. Um, George Can Sr., of course, was at that stage, he was curator of reptiles at Taronga. Um, Eric Worrell was setting up his aquarium at Ocean Beach. So it was certain that if you were interested in reptiles, you knew of others with the same interest. Okay. Now, I can't even see those up there. However, this is a, an interesting, it's, um, we have uh, three people there, Roy Mackay holding a diamond python. In the middle, um, you then have uh, Neville Goddard, and on the other side, you have Kevin Budden. Now, all, these, all three of these guys were founding members of the Australian Reptile Club. Um, 
And it seems pretty obvious now from the people I've spoken to who were around at that time that most of the original members of the Reptile Club knew each other long before the Reptile Club was formed. So they were already a group, they were doing field work, they were out there catching reptiles. Um, this photo is of these three, they were organising a trip to North Queensland in search of taipans. They found one, but they failed to catch it. So um, <coughs> that went that way. Now, the person responsible for the creation of the Australian Reptile Club, which subsequently became the, the AHS, was Roy Mackay. Um, Roy told me that a, a friend of his, Alex Holmes, who was called Rusty, um, had been pestering him for some time to set up a group where people could meet and exchange views and information. So at the first meeting, which was in April 1949, that's According to, to Roy, that's when it was. We know there was Roy Mackay there, Rusty Holmes was there, Kevin Budden, Neville Goddard, um, the Dwyer brothers and the Hosmer brothers were both there and possibly a few others. Now, if it did start in April 1949, the meeting, and there was a meeting, it must have been between the 1st and 5th of April because these three guys left on the 6th for Cohen for North Queensland to catch taipans, and they were away for six weeks. So um, that sort of solves that. Okay. Now, meetings were held at the um, home of Roy's parents in Newtown, and there's quite a few stories about that. This was at about 1953. Then they had meetings at the YMCA in Sydney until about 1967 at which stage then it went to the home of the president. Jeff Manning was the president at the time, and he reckoned it was because they wanted to get rid of the rat bags and just have people who were seriously interested in reptiles, not just catching them. Um, I actually think it was more a case of because they didn't have any money and they had to pay one pound, one shilling, a guinea a week, a guinea a month um, for the hire of the hall, um, which was 12 pounds, 12 shillings. Um, so they decided to hive it in, in the house of the president because that was cheaper. Um, and it was about that time that I became interested in the society, joined the society, which would have been about uh, 1969, I guess, um, before most of you were born. Um, now, out there, Jeff at that stage, Jeff and, and his wife were out at a place, Riverston, semi-rural in those days, believe me, there was no suburban development there at that time. Um, and it was great, you drive in there. First of all, you had to get from your car to the house and negotiate the wombat that was roaming around. On the screen door would be a flying fox was hanging from the screen door, so you had to get past that. And then inside, I think there was a um, sulphur crested cockatoo and something else, a tawny frog mouse sitting on the back of the chairs. So it was quite a menagerie. Um, but by 1979, we were holding meetings at the Parramatta Town Hall. That continued until about 1974. Um, Parramatta was a very popular meeting place. Um, and I, I can remember at that stage when we first moved there, we had a membership probably of about 10 or 12. Within 12 months, we had memberships of over 100, and it kept going up. So I think at the, at the peak, it was somewhere around about 150 or 160 members. Um, a lot of people liked Parramatta. Um, in 75, meetings were held at the Australian Museum in conjunction with the herpetology section of the Royal Zoological Society, and they continued to be held there for the rest of the 20th century. Now this, what's that got to do with this photo? Well, this is an interesting photo. Roy Mackay gave me this photo, and he and David McPhee identified the people in it, except for the blonde lady, the second on that side, um, who we weren't able to identify. They actually thought that it was a club meeting in the early 50s. Now, it was certainly taken in the early 50s, but the only question I raised with them what her meeting did you ever attend to in a collar and tie and jacket? Uh, so it didn't sort of make much sense. However, they were all, all there. Um, at the back, starting from the far side, was Margaret Mackay, Roy Mackay's, I think she was Margaret Lovett at that stage, became Roy Mackay. David McPhee is next to her. Anthony Graham, Laurie Grinup, Ali, Alan Willows, Ray Witchart, 
Hans Verborg, Roy Mackay is on this end, and in the front was Fred Frick, uh, the mystery lady. Um, then we had Sophie Verborg, we had Alex Holmes' wife, Martin Leeper, and Rusty Holmes. So it was, they were all members of the group at that stage, but what the photo was taken for is, is anybody's guess. Now, uh, ooh, ooh, okay. This, you, the, the name Australian Reptile Club, ARC, was chosen rather than Australian Reptile Society, which is ARS. So we don't need to go into that, but that's how Australian Reptile Club came to be formed. The name changed to Australian Herpetological Society in either 1955 or 1956. Now, some members did not want, they preferred Australian Reptile Club. They didn't want Australian Herpetological Society. However, that's what had happened, they went through there. But interesting, this particular photo, which was taken in Brisbane and features um, Bill Hosmore, um, it's uh, John Dwyer and, and uh, Ken Dwyer. Um, they decided in 1951, they decided to go north into Queensland after Taipans. Taipan. Everyone was after Taipans. So they were going up there. If you look down the, the badge on the bag there, there's a badge there that says Australian Reptile Society Expedition 1951. So how come we had the Australian Reptile Society, or the Australian Herpetological Society, rather, in 1951? Um, John Dwyer told me that they used that name because they felt it sounded more professional than Australian Reptile Club. So Australian Herpetological Society sounded a bit more upmarket. And they didn't want to be seen as just out there collecting animals. So, um, so that's when it went. But the name, there was never a society formed. They never had any meetings, nothing further happened. It was only there, the badge was made showing that. But um, it didn't, didn't go any further than that. Okay, so field trips were fairly, fairly frequent in the early days. And the first one was in April 1950, it was on Anzac Day. It was at Hornsby Heights. In those days, Hornsby was very rural. Um, 19 members and guests attended. There are 16 of them in this photo. Um, unfortunately, I don't, can't point out to you, but uh, there is a, a very young Hal Cogger there, um, right at the far end. Um, there are several others, Rusty Holmes, Bill Hosmore, Ray Mackay, Roy Mackay, Kevin Budden, Kevin Budden then left to, uh, just after this, left to go north, chasing taipans as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, this was another photo taken on the same trip. And it was apparently, supposedly, the first snake that was caught on that trip. Uh, I was told by somebody that the first snake caught was a yellow-faced whip snake, um, but I don't think that's a yellow-faced whip snake. Um, I was also told there was a couple of young diamond pythons caught. Uh, that's Bill Hosmer, Hosmer holding the, um, the snake. Next to him is one of the lady members, Muriel Scott Sim. Um, dress, and you'll notice the dress for field trips in the 50s, okay? Just make a note of it. Uh, Alan Steele, again, there's a young Hal Cogger there. Um, Ken Smith and Fred Frick. I'll probably have a little bit more to say about Fred if we have time. Um, okay, one of the other popular field trip destinations in those days was after Copperheads and was at Windsor Caribbean Swamp. And members would go down, in most cases members didn't have cars so they had to catch the train. The nearest station was Burrowang Station. It probably no longer exists now. Um, in those days, and it had a water tank there. You can see the water tank because it was steam trains in those days. Um, and a, they formed this uh, situation. Somebody drew on the, copper, on the water tank the logo of the Australian Reptile Club. And underneath it, they used to, every time they went on a trip there, they'd put the date of the trip and the number of copperheads caught. Unfortunately, I cannot 
find anyone who has a photo of that, but that's the water tank and that's the station. Um, Oh. <laughs> and I ran underneath, me and Pop caught seven and kept them. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> Thank you, John. Now, there are a few stories of bags of copperheads being tipped out around various places in Sydney. In those days, you have to remember that none of the sophisticated we, we've got, um, they would have use sugar bags, you know, Hessian bags. Stick, stick any animals in those. Um, apparently there were copperheads tipped out of a bag at Central Station on one occasion. Haven't been able to find out too much more about that. Outside the Gladesville Picture Theatre on a Saturday night, um, and I'm told that that was uh, Bill Irvine um, was coming back from somewhere and someone asked him, what have you got in the bag? And he said, copperheads, and tipped it out on the pavement. And, um, that happened, and the other one was actually in Burrowang Station with David McPhee and some others have been down there. And a bunch of photographers from Photographic Society were out there and came in at the same time to catch the train. So they decided to give them something to photograph and tip the copperheads out on the floor of the waiting room there. And that, that sorted things out from there. Now, Nora Head was another area that was frequently visited in the early days, apparently because of the death adders that were supposed to be up there. But I was told they only ever caught one on one occasion. But the local store, it was a popular place for a popular holiday area, Nora Head. Um, the local store owner up there used to give members a place to camp and while well, they were there. And in return, they would do a snake show. So snake shows and any money handed in, they'd give to the local progress association. So here you have one of the snake shows being done. Um, quite a crowd, a lot of people there. Um, these photos, this is Mick Bauer, um, the guy there, he's milking a black snake there. And you can see the health and safety is, is very keen here. Little children there, five and six year olds, barefoot, uh, you know, about a metre away from these, from the, Blacks weren't the only thing they were tipping out. There was all sorts of things they bought. I think there was even a death adder bought up at one stage. So, um, yes, these uh, sort of field trips were quite common. Now, here's another. This is advancing a few years. So we're now in the early 70s. And this was a field trip that was undertaken, I think, probably about uh, 73, up around Narara. There's a few people. Most of them are completely unrecognisable, but... Uh, we have um, Keith Martin there, a young Keith Martin. We have a young Richard Wells, Jack Verhagen, myself, and the others, I've got no idea who they are. Um, but you can see again that the fashion was changing in terms of field trips. So looking, looking very good there. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> there were a lot of, in the 70s, a lot of field trips, some were good. Some weren't, so it depended a lot on the committee at the time, how well they were organised and what happened. Um, this one, up in the late 90s into 2006, um, the society was running field trips of about 10 to 14 day duration, usually in the school holidays, August, September. And it was usually in collaboration with the Australian Museum. These field trips were only to national parks. So we did Mutawinji National Parks over three years. We did Sturt National Park over four years. We did Piri National Park over three, Nokalichi Nature Reserve over two, and Gundabuka National. Um, and this is a, a group of the um, people. You'll see a couple there, Glenn Shea sitting there, and uh, you know, a couple of other people. Um, and again, fashions have changed. Um, uh, and I see Phil Spark, who's here. He's also, <laughs> he's there. Um, we won't embarrass people by pointing out who's what. Um, so field trips were an important part of the site and had been right from the very beginning. Um, now, snake bite was fairly common, but mostly from the smaller types of um, lapids. But occasionally from one of the more venomous, this uh, photo here shows the victim of a broad-headed snake bite receiving attention. 
Um, now the victim is Rusty Holmes. He got bitten on the finger. You can see there's a ligature around his finger. He's dying there, feigning death. Um, Anthony Graham is the guy standing above him, giving him a victory salute. Um, Anthony Graham and Rusty Holmes didn't get on, so Anthony was hoping like hell he'd be dead within a few minutes. Um, the one with his back to us is, or to the, the camera, is Roy Mackay, and he is sharpening a blunt hypodermic needle with a file. Um, the victim survived. He was given tiger snake antivenom, which was seemed to be carried by some members at that time would carry it around. Um, how he did survive, but he reckoned the um, treatment was far worse than the bite. Um, and that was a, an, an Australian Museum publication, a sheet on, on Australian snakes, bites and treatment. It was about 1950. Won't go into details, but it tells you that you should catch the snake. Um, you should put a tourniquet on. Um, you should slash the bite and then suck the wound to get the blood out. It's all sort of, which, of course, we follow now religiously. So things have changed. Things have changed. And of course, if you're out, you were lucky there was someone there to had a bag to open the, open the bag for you. Um, that's one of the early members, uh, Wall Lorking, um, very tall guy. He got a brown there, lowering it into a bag. Um, John Corcoran is a young guy that's there holding the bag up, just a Hessian sugar bag, holding it open um, and dropping it in. Uh, so. Uh, that's a young David Miller. That one would have been about 1965. Uh, Noosing a, a goanna out uh, south or northwest somewhere. Um, and you see, improvisation was always a key thing if you were a herpetologist in those days. No such things as hoop bags and uh, jiggers. Although there was a jigger in 1951 on that AHS trip. Um, but uh, yeah, on it went. Now, this is uh, Kevin Budden. Um, Kevin was a foundation member, and I guess there was one thing that he died in July 1950 from a bite of a taipan. Um, now, it's covered in um, Brendan Murray's book, Venom, and also I think you can, you can see it on the, the website, David Williams' website, goes into it in detail. And it undoubtedly, he was a close friend of Roy Mackay and, and the other founding members. He's a popular guy. Um, and it was definitely, I think, a huge impact on that society. And um, <coughs> it had um, quite a profound effect, which I'll cover shortly, particularly with juveniles, juvenile members, younger members. Um, and there were some strange things happened, but Kevin, Kevin had some um, rather unorthodox views on snake bite. He considered most people didn't die of snake bite, they died of shock. And apparently it was a theory that was advanced at the time. Kevin had had other snake bites before that. This wasn't his first, it was his first type N one, obviously. Um, but the thing that, and I've talked to other people about it, and we scratch our heads because Kevin went up, he was on his own. There was no anti-venom for a taipan, you, you died. That was it. He was on his own. He didn't have a jigger. He didn't know no such thing as a hoop bag or anything like that. And um, yeah, he actually caught the snake successfully and it was only later when, you'd need to read about the whole story. It's a most interesting read, that. Um, but however, it did have a very profound effect on the society and the way they operated probably over the next 10 to 15 years, simply because of that, because he was so well known to all the original members. Um, now, okay, publications, um, they happen, they do them. The Australian Reptile Club produced two. The first one was in 1952, and was called the ARC Journal, it had four issues. The second one was in 1959, and was called Reptilia, and that's the cover, and there was about um, six issues of that. Um, so <clears throat> that uh, nothing much else happened until 1963, and that's the front page of the first issue of Herbert of Fauna, which came out in 1963. Um, David Miller um, had a sort of a key hand in sort of putting that all together. He was secretary at the time, and it was quite well done. 
but very difficult. Of course, no, no photocopiers or anything, that computers or anything else in those days. You did it all by hand the long way. Um, there was a lot of talk in there. There was talk about every member was going to have to produce one article each year so that it would be published in Herbert of Fauna. It couldn't have been very successful because the next issue of Herbert of Fauna wasn't until 1970. So, um, and that was it. Again, David Miller was involved, um, and it was spelt incorrectly. You can see it was spelt Herpeta Fauna instead of T A F instead of T O F. Um, but that came out. They were they were generated on those um, by uh, sort of jelly pads and, and sort of Ronio type situations. So it was purely a newsletter for members of the society, and there weren't that many members, so they didn't produce a hell of a lot. Um, then in the um, 73, this is the last issue of Herbert of Fauna by the Australian Herb Society, because after that, Herbert of Fauna was taken over by the Australasian affiliation of herpetological societies and produced by that organisation, not by the AHS. Um, so the AHS went to producing newsletters from that. So, um, okay, what have we got? Okay, juniors. Now this is, again, Wal Lorking was a very prominent member in the early days, a big, big, tall, lanky guy there. The other young person there is um, uh, Henry Herschel. Henry Herschel, for some older people will remember, he was a vet. He was a member, of one of the early members. He joined the society when he was 11. And on the first meeting he attended, he was bitten by a yellow-faced whipsnake. And he says, oh, it was a bit painful. It sort of felt, Henry's still alive. He's up north there somewhere. Um, this photo was taken in 1955. So Henry at that stage was probably 15. Um, he went with Bill Irvine up to the Atherton Tablelands after Scrubbies, and that's one that he brought back. So, um, you know, that's probably why members, the committee members of the society were a little bit worried about juniors. Um, <clears throat> that's what happened. But Henry, of course, was a vet, and I can remember back then in the, in the 70s and 80s, if you went to a vet with a reptile, he got thrown out the front door. There was no way in the wide world that even look at it. And Henry was one of the very, very few vets that A, knew something about them and would offer suggestions on how to, how to treat things. Um, now, interesting on that, we're dealing with juniors, and I say they, they were a big problem uh, for the committee in, in those days. And I read, happened to read the annual report for 1962-1963, and junior member... J. Smith was expelled from the society. B. Bush was suspended for six months. And uh, Ghost of Von Schweinfurth was reprimanded, all for keeping forbidden reptiles. So I thought, hmm, that's interesting. B. Bush, that must be Brian Bush over in WA, old Bushy. So I gave him a ring. And he said, yes, that was me, that was me. He, he, he'd been born and brought up in Sydney. He said, um, Smithy was expelled because we were all warned because we'd already been caught keeping venomous snakes. So Smithy was expelled because he actually got bitten by a brown snake. So therefore they chucked him out. He said, I got suspended because um, I was keeping the snakes in the house and my mother objected to it and she used to ring Roy Mackay and he would come around and collect them and take them away. But then what I did, I kept them under the house and she didn't know about it. Um, and I also give, gave talks to local schools. He was at school himself. He'd go and give talks to local schools about snakes, taking along venomous tiger snakes, black snakes, you know, all sorts of stuff. So he got suspended for six months. Von, von Schweinfurth apparently was just keeping them and hadn't strayed too far from the straight and narrow, so, so he, was, he was reprimanded. So um, that was the sort of thing that, that went on. Um, and uh, it went on for some time. There used to be a situation where I think they, you could join when you were 16, um, but you weren't allowed to keep dangerous reptiles, i.e. venomous snakes, monitors, or crocodiles and under the age of 18. So, <clears throat> yeah, fair enough, that's all right. So let's go on, okay. There was, films were an interesting thing. Um, first of all, a lot of the early members were involved in filmmaking. Um, 
Rusty Holmes and Wal Lorking were at one stage employed by Amand Dennis Film Corporation, the French organisation, who were doing three full length feature films on Australia and they were employed to catch the reptiles and do all the, the snake wrangling. Um, John, this is John Corcoran, who was one of the early members as a school kid. Um, he was working for a mob called Simba Film Productions in the Northern Territory in Queensland. And John had previously been a drover and a ringer. He left school, he was probably 16, went up to the New England Tablelands to a sheep station, learned how to ride a horse, then took the train up to Mount Isa and hitched across to Tennant Creek and signed up as a drover on a droving crew. Um, did that for several years. Um, and his job with Simba Film Productions was A, to catch the reptiles they wanted to film and also to find the food for the pot. So you see a dead buffalo there and crab there. That was, that was his job. So I was good, you know, no, no trouble. Years droving and running around chasing reptiles, it was all easy. Um, so um, it was interesting too because he went up, the young guy that was at the, um, doing the Nora Head things, uh, Mick Bauer, also went up with him and they signed up on the same droving crew. Um, Mick, uh, John, after some years, came back and followed other courses, but Mick always was a drover and a ringer up in the Territory. Um, he's still there, he lives in uh, Catherine, yeah, so he's still alive. Um, but he told me, he told me about uh, the um, copperheads around at the, uh, the theatre. But however, he also mentioned to me that the crew that they joined, the droving crew, was being run by a woman, an Edna Ziegenbein, who, whose father was one of the big drovers of the time. And she was apparently an excellent horsewoman, excellent drover. Anyway, they signed up with her. Um, and Mick said, you know, it was interesting because it'd come at night, you'd, you'd come to camp, and she'd sing out, now you ringers, just be careful, you keep keep your, your feet off my devil. And she actually had a thorny devil and she used to get it out of the bag in the evening, go and find an ant's nest, a trail of ants somewhere. She would tie a string to it and, and to a horseshoe and put it there for the night. Um, <laughs> and he said, oh yeah, she used to do this every night. <laughs> so, so she was one of the early reptile keepers. Um, the other thing that was of interest was that the Australian Reptile Club actually had produced a feature film it runs for nine minutes, 14 seconds. It's called Strange Fascination. It was done about mm, 1951, 1952, something like that. Um, it involved, I think, uh, probably about eight of the club members, um, including Hal Cogger, who was the victim of a snake bite. Um, some of the filming was done probably somewhere like Oxford Falls and some elsewhere. Um, it's a very interesting film, black and white, and it was done professionally. This is no eight millimeter crap. This is a 16 mil, and it was done by Jacques Bertel, who was the produ had a producer. And the two girls that came on, I won't go into the story of what it's about. Um, but uh, yeah, there were eight of them. It, it showed, it was trying to show what the Australian Reptile Club was about, what it did, how they went about it, and the treatment of snake bite at the time, which was, if I think from Hal's point of view, he got bitten, it was a tourniquet, it was slashing, and then it was a hypodermic needle to actually draw the blood out from the site of the bite. So yeah, nothing was injected. So. Okay, so that, that's, let's move on. It's, I must be almost out of time. Okay, badges and insignia and all that sort of stuff, early days. Australian Reptile Club, that was about 1950. Most members didn't like it because they reckoned it looked more like a worm than a snake. Um, so it didn't last long. The next one was this one, Australian Reptile Club. That was about 1952. Um, and I think the funds for that were courtesy of Sir Edward Hallstrom at Taronga Zoo. I mean, let's face it, the club had no money. But however, I'm told that he paid for the badge to be produced. Um, so that was the two Australian Reptile Club. They also had a, a cloth um, patch which a lot of them had sewn on their jackets or shirts or what have you. Some Australian Reptile Club, the snake. Oh, they were way ahead of their times. 
Um, then, of course, the Australian Herpetological Society, that badge is probably about 1972. And I think there is a subsequent one which was the same design but was blue, um, which later probably in the 80s or something like that. So I don't know whether there's any different one now. Okay. Um, probably should talk about licensing, eh? Ha, 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 licensing. Licensing was an interesting thing. Um, when the reptile club was around in the early days, of course, reptiles weren't protected. Um, so therefore, you wanted a reptile, you just went out and caught one. That was all good. Then in 1974, they decided it was time to protect reptiles. So National Parks and their wisdom decided to do that. And there was supposed to be a structure for people to legally keep reptiles. But that was a load of crap. I mean, it was just simply to bury it. Um, the interesting thing, though, is during the consultation program, they decided to have a consultation progress. And the people invited, everyone was interested, parties were invited except the Australian Herpetological Society. And there was uh, Dr. Hal Cogger from the Australian Museum, Eric Worrell from the Australian Reptile Park, Graham Gow, who was the chairman of the herpetological section of the Royal Zoological Society of New South Wales. They were the interested parties. The AHS didn't get a look in. Um, they said it was a mistake because they said they had an old brochure which had a name written on it somewhere, and the name was Greg Ackland. Now, Greg Ackland was a member of the society and was involved in designing this brochure. How the National Parks got it, I don't know. But Greg was also a vet. He'd qualified as a vet. He went to the, the Americas. He was in the US as a highly qualified veterinary surgeon over there. So at the time they were looking for him, he wasn't even in Australia. He was no longer a member of the society. And they never got hold of him. I think that was actually just a, that was just a, some crap they put up to try and get over the fact they didn't want us there because they knew we'd raise questions and want answers. Um, it came in in 74 though, of course, came in and um, there were 10 species, 10 animals that were on an exempt list. So you could keep these without a license, but you could only keep in total, a total of two animals. So and these were Cunningham skink, uh, blue tongue, single back, but only if you're west of the ranges, um, eastern water dragon, eastern water skink, swamp snake, carpet snake, and a couple of the turtles, long neck and short neck turtles. Um, so of course that went down like a lead balloon and nobody, most people didn't even bother to get a license, they just carried on doing what they were doing. So of course, by the 80s, 95% of members of the Australian Herpetological Society were highly illegal because they were keeping reptiles and, and national parks would not give any more licenses. People tried to apply for a license and were only told there was that exemplus, that's all you can have, two animals in total. And of course, the um, law enforcement section of national parks, which was all made up of ex-coppers, who'd probably been sacked from the police force anyway, and just delighted in raiding houses of young kids and threatening them and doing everything else. However, in 1984, the Reptile Keepers Association was formed, headed by John Weigel, John Montgomery, and uh, Jeff Banks. Um, and they almost succeeded in getting working legislation but of course the minister was completely unsympathetic and that went down the tube. So uh, later on, Glenn Shea and myself picked up the baton and I think it took us about eight to 10 years, but in 1996, we finally got um, legislation in. Um, and which was, apart from the work we did, it was entirely the, because of Neil Shepherd, who was brought into national parks as a director Oh, as a, as, yeah, as the director. Um, but in a temporary, I think they'd sacked the previous one and brought him in. And he was the only director of national parks that we ever met. None of the other, the others refused to meet with us or have anything to do with us. He met us and said, we'll get that in. I won't, uh, his thoughts on reptile keeping were interesting. And they certainly are not borne out. But however, we did get it in, came in in 1996. Okay, let's move on. Uh, what have we got here? Oh, that was the, the interesting little brochure. Quite an interesting one. You might even be able to read I can't read it from here. But um, tells where you meet, how can you join, uh, who to contact. And there you have Bill Irvine, David Miller, Henry Hershorn, all, all good people. They were obviously on the committee. It set out the aims of the society 
and um, membership, you had to be 16. Um, and if you were up to 18, it, cost, it would cost you 10 shillings. Now, for those that don't know anything about real money, um, 10 shillings was $1, OK? Um, and if you're, a, if you're over 18, it cost you one pound. One pound was $2, OK? So I mean, it was pretty good value in those days. Had some lovely aims and objectives of the society. But that was the, that was the pamphlet that National Parks had somehow got hold of and it had Greg Ackland's name scribbled on it somewhere. They didn't bother contacting the three guys that were on the back. Um, so, but yeah, OK, let's move on. That's, that's history now, so... Okay, a few, a few people in the early days. That's Bill Irvine um, in his youth. Um, now, of course, Bill, um, in 1969, he was bitten by a water moccasin, which is a venomous snake from the United States. Okay, so that happens. By a strange twist of fate, the Australian Reptile Park happened to have anti-venom for that, but that's another story. The, the real story is that Australian customs got very interested in this and they went right into action and they tracked down people and then simultaneously one Saturday in four states they raided dozens of collectors and they all had their phones tapped for further information and if you rang up you'd been raided and rang up someone else to let them know then that was jotted down so <clears throat> those caught of course with animals that were exotic, weren't, weren't licensed, or weren't for customs. It was basically foreign animals, exotic animals. Um, if they caught, they faced charges, and under the Custom Act, you were guilty unless you could prove your innocence. There was no innocence unless guilt was proved. You were guilty, and you had to prove your innocence. And the maximum fine at that stage was about $1,000 per offence. So. Um, so that's when customs started to get very interested in exotic animals coming into and out of Australia and it sort of lowered the boom. And Bill was unfortunately the person that got bitten by one and that sort of made, made the headlines. Um, this guy, Horry Rowe, he was one of the foundation members. <coughs> he had a, um, a animal park um, somewhere. Where was it? Chris and... Um, Granville, yeah, yeah. And some of the, strange, the film Strange Fascination was fil had filmed over there. Um, it was around for many years, that, uh, that park. Um, so he was one of the early members. Um, that was um, Mick Bauer, I mentioned before, went droving, was, was up there as a ringer drover, a head, head, head ringer. Um, that was him in his early days. This one is interesting, it's Bill Hosmer, who was known by some members of the club at that stage as the um, bald vodgy. Um, but the photo he's got is a photo of a taipan, and it was a taipan that John Dwyer caught on a trip with Eric Worrell and Wal Lorking. And I think if you, in a few books, um, Snake Bitten has the photo, there's a photo in there of Worrell milking the taipan, which is being, I think the beaker is being held by Dwyer and Lorking is, is also holding the snake. Um, the story of it is they caught the taipan and Bill Hosmer was also up there in Cairns at the time, at the caravan park, and they wanted to do some more work. So they caught up with, with Bill and said, look, can you look after the snake for us, the taipan, but can you just hold it for us? For a few days and we'll come back and pick up and then we're heading heading south um, and he said that's fine so while they were away he had a photograph of himself taken holding it and when they got back eric worrell apparently was absolutely livid um, and he tracked down a professional photographer in cairns and the next morning they went around and that photograph which is in uh, certainly in the book snake button um, and is one that features quite probably a young worrell lorking and dwyer milking the taipan because Eric, he wanted the publicity, of course, you know, reptile parks, you know, some guy like this coming in and taking his thunder. So he wanted the photograph and got that photograph out. So that was Bill Hosmer, strange, strange guy. Um, David McPhee in his early days um, with his uh, 
tiger snake, um, which he'd kept for a long, he bred that up from a young one, which is quite a, a feat in those days. David was never interested in reptiles as a young guy, as a child or an early. In fact, his early account, when I read it, he said, David said to me, he said, one day Alex Hol Rusty Holmes came in, because David was a bookman, so he was into books, and he worked for Angus and Robertson in the, and what they called second hand, which was the antique book section. Anyway, Rusty Holmes came into the department where he was working and pulled out a live marsh snake, as you do, out of his shirt pocket, and said, have you ever seen one of these before? And David said he was absolutely astonished. It was a complete understatement. He knew nothing about snakes whatsoever, but he was absolutely fascinated. He was hooked on it and was a devotee of herpetology overnight and came in, and as many of you would know, he assembled probably the finest collection of herpetological books in Australia. Um, anyway, so, so that, that, that was that. Yeah, let's move on. I'm probably running out of time, am I now? Must be. <gasps> it's almost four o'clock. Um, David Miller was secretary in the um, 60s, launched, launched Herpeta Fauna in 1963, of course. Um, was also involved in the, the merger of the Herp Society of the Royal Zoological Society and, and the AHS. Um, and uh, he was involved in a lot of stuff in those days. Better move on. Come on. Okay. There's a, an interesting picture taken in the early 70s. The uh, four people there from the far side to this are, of course, uh, Robert Cook, Alex Antonor, um, there's Peter Rankin, and uh, Richard Wells. Um, that's on one of the trips. Peter, of course, uh, was another, um, was one of the, the significant events of the, the society over the years. Peter, he joined the, the Herf Society in 1971 when he was still at school. He had a very active interest in herpetology and served as a secretary. He had just completed his degree in science at Macquarie University and went to New Caledonia uh, with Ross Sadlier. Um, they were collecting, and on the 2nd of January 1979, Peter was killed climbing a tree in the humid jungle there, the humid forest, to catch one of the New Caledonian giant geckos. Um, and believe me, the trees in there are very tall. The geckos are 30 metres up in the tree. Anyway, it was most unfortunate. Um, Peter was an absolutely promising guy. Um, and it was a big blow to society and to members. <coughs> it affected everyone, I think, in those days. Um, but that was a field trip. They're obviously on the New South Wales border. Um, OK, a few other members. Um, very quickly, we'll move through here. Barry Lowe and Jack Verhagen, um, they came in about the same time as I did in the late 60s. Uh, we had some interesting times. Jack uh, Barry was, was a great organiser, secretarial guy. Um, Jack was good. Um, Jack Verhagen was great because he used to produce Herpeta Fauna in those days. He was the accountant in a, in a life insurance company. And in those days, they had their own printing departments. So they'd pull together what all the material for Herpeta Fauna. Jack would organise his typist to type it up and then con the printer, the company printer, to run it off, tack it on the end of a job and run it off. And the, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it went on forever, that. Um, they did well. That was the 50th anniversary of the AHS in, in 1999. Um, Daniel Holloway was the chairman of the organising committee and did an absolutely fantastic job. It was a great conference, that. David Barker came over from the States. Um, Hal, he and Hal Cogger were the keynote speakers. Um, there were other papers presented. It was over a two-day conference. Um, Peter Harlow, Chris Banks, Glenn Shea, Rob Porter, Greg Fife, Anthony Stimson, Spracklin, Robert Spracklin. Roy, uh, Roy Mackay actually attended that. He came down from Paluma um, in Queensland, where he'd retired, came down to, um, to uh, attend the conference. Okay. All right. That's uh, Roy uh, in an earlier stage. I'm not quite sure why he has a large knife next to him, but Roy was the, the founder of the Australian Reptile Club, and there would have been no AHS without Roy. He did it. Um, he died earlier this year, um, age 90, 
And I read in the Red Bank Courier, I think at the time, there was a two-page piece written by Brendan Murray, which was quite nice. But I think it would be appropriate for the current committee to consider a way where Roy could be remembered in a more permanent manner. It would be interesting to ask everyone here how many people, what does the name Roy Mackay mean to them? And the majority would never have heard of it. Some of the older guys, of course, would, some of us. Others would not know at all. But he actually founded this, this club 70 years ago. And um, it just seems a pity that um, future members get to be ignorant of its formation and involvement. Um, one big thing for Roy is that he, in all the years that he was involved in reptiles in Australia, he never got bitten by a dangerously venomous lapidus. He was 100% clean. But he went to New Guinea in, I think in the 60s or 70s. He was in New Guinea working there. And um, he actually got bitten by a death adder in 1988. The place that he was bitten, he was with another guy, and they were looking at, I think, birds of paradise. Anyway, they came to cross a river, he saw a snake there and thought, oh, yes, it's one of these uh, harmless colubrids, a tropinocus or something. It wasn't. It turned out to be a death adder and it bit him. Um, they were two days away from anywhere. So it was only him and the other guy, no anti-venom or anything like that. Um, he spent six hours, the rest of that day for six hours, no anti-venom, no, no nothing. Walk. They camped at a village that night and that's when it all set in. He started to get eyelids going, everything going. And they, the, the natives there, villagers carried him out for 10 hours the next day <coughs> to the roadhead so he could be taken out. Um, so that was the only bite that Roy ever got. He never got anti-venom for it, um, death at it, and he survived the bite. But, uh, you know, so he was told by the doctor, yeah, if you survive the first 36 hours, you're okay because the, the venom tends to neutralize from there. Um, that's it, okay. That's the first one. Thanks, Jerry. No, that's good. That's good. You nailed it. I had a really nice introduction written for Jerry as well. And in my haste to get everything done, I um I didn't read Jerry's introduction, and there's all these really good jokes in there about Jerry originally being a New Zealander and. He's been in Australia longer than Russell Crowe or Farlapper, and it would 